Hi, Matthias from 10 Minute Physics here. Today, I will talk about the core subject in the body simulation, the simulation of joints. With this knowledge, you will be able to simulate almost any mechanical system you can think of, such as cars or robots. Many existing techniques are complex and hard to understand. I will show you a simple method that is also more robust than many existing techniques. I will cover an entire subject in only 15 minutes. However, I will include the source code as well as the slides so you can go at your own pace. This is my simulation demo. As usual, I wrote it in JavaScript so you can run it directly in your browser. I will put a link to the demo and the source code in the description. This is a hinge joint with angle limits. Here we have the same hinge joint damped. This is a ball and socket joint with swing and twist limits. Here we have a prismatic joint with a target offset and a given stiffness. And here the same joint damped. These three joints can be controlled. We have a motor, a servo and a cylinder joint. I can control them with this simple touch interface. With these basic joints we can create any mechanical system we like. Here you see the steering mechanism of a car. I created this setup in Blender with custom parameters. In the next tutorial I will show you my Blender exporter and importer so you can create your own cool demos. This final scene shows the power of position based simulation with substepping. Here we have a double pendulum. There is very little numerical damping. This is a triple pendulum. Position based dynamics allows the resolution of the fast moving third segment. This demo shows how position-based dynamics can handle very large mass ratios. The mass of the box at the bottom is 200 times the mass of the segments. Now let me show you how joint simulation works. We will employ extended position-based dynamics, which I introduced in tutorial number 9. This method is very simple to implement and unconditionally stable, meaning it never blows up, even for infinite stiffnesses, which makes it well suited for interactive applications. Unlike the original position-based dynamics method, extended position-based dynamics is physically based and it lets us handle true physical quantities like forces, torques and stiffnesses with high fidelity. Traditional rigid body simulation methods require solving complicated large systems of complementarity problems. In contrast with XPBD, all we need to do is executing simple formulas that are easy to understand. To make the tutorial self-contained, I will give you a short recap of rigid body simulation with XPBD. Have a look at tutorial number 22 for a detailed explanation. The traditional position-based dynamics method uses particles. Here you see the simulation loop in pseudocode. In every time step, we first perform what is called an integration step. We run through all the particles. We add gravity times the time step size delta t to the velocity. Next we store the position x in a variable p. Then we add the velocity times the time step size to the position. This integration method is called semi-implicit Euler method. After the integration we solve all constraints. We repeat this for a given number of iterations. One of the most used constraints is the distance constraint. It is used in cloth and soft body simulations. The distance constraint makes sure that the distance between pairs of particles equals the rest distance. After solving all constraints, the velocities of the particles are updated. The new velocity is set to the position after the solve minus the position before the solve divided by delta t. In position-based dynamics, we solve a constraint by computing correction vectors delta x for all the particles participating in the constraint. These correction vectors are then immediately added to the particle positions after each constraint is solved. Position-based dynamics manipulates particle positions directly, contrasting with traditional methods that work with velocities or forces. This direct manipulation of positions gives the method its name and contributes to its intuitive nature and stability. What I showed you is called a local solver. It solves each constraint one at a time. Local solvers are much easier to implement and understand than global solvers. Global solvers solve all the constraints simultaneously. The only disadvantage of local solvers is that they converge more slowly, which makes joints look stretchy. Fortunately, there is a super simple method to solve this problem. 
In the algorithm I described before, we iterate through all the constraints n times. Instead of performing any iteration over all the constraints, we use a single iteration, but subdivide the simulation step into multiple substeps. The effect is truly amazing. This simple modification makes our local solver converge as fast as global solvers. Now let us extend the method from particles to rigid bodies. In addition to position, linear velocity and mass, a rigid body possesses corresponding angular quantities, an orientation q, an angular velocity omega, and the moment of inertia i. The orientation q is typically represented by a quaternion, the angular velocity is a 3D vector, and the moment of inertia is also a 3D vector in the rest pose of the rigid body. It can be pre-computed from the shape of the body. Now let's have a look at how we can extend position-based dynamics to handle rigid bodies. In addition to handling the linear quantities x and v, we must now also handle the rotational quantities omega and q. We need to integrate them in time and update them after solving the constraints. A constraint can affect both position and orientation of the body. Therefore we compute updates delta x and delta q for each constraint. Then we apply them to the position x and the orientation q. I will now show you how to handle two basic constraints. The first is a distance constraint. Let's first recap the distance constraint between two simple particles. The constraint forces the distance between the particles to be L0. Here the current distance L is larger than L0. Therefore we move the particles toward each other. We split the correction delta x into delta x1 and delta x2 proportional to the inverse masses of the particles. For rigid bodies we must specify where on the bodies the distance constraint is attached. We call these positions in world space P1 and P2. In our example, the current distance between the attachment points is larger than L0. Therefore we pull the attachment points toward each other. Doing this pulls the centers of mass x1 and x2 closer to each other by delta x1 and delta x2. It also causes the rotations q1 and q2 of the bodies as shown in yellow. The rotations are distributed proportional to the inverse moments of inertia i1 and i2. Here you see the procedure to compute these corrections. It looks quite complicated. Fortunately, you don't really need to understand these formulas. I won't derive them here, maybe in a future tutorial. You will find the implementation in my code. As you can see, the procedure takes as input the locations of the attachment points P1 and P2. It also takes a correction vector delta P and the compliance alpha. In the last two statements in yellow, you see how the positions and orientations of the bodies are updated. This procedure and its angular version that I will show in a minute are the only procedures that are not straightforward to understand. Everything else we will build on top of these is intuitive. The compliance alpha here is the inverse of physical stiffness. W is the inverse of mass. The fact that we work with inverses lets us handle infinite stiffness and infinite mass simply and stably. We can compute the force that acts on the constraint as lambda times n divided by delta t squared. The second basic constraint we need to be able to handle is the orientation constraint. In this case we want to fix the relative orientations of the bodies. In this particular example we want the two bodies to be aligned. We can compute an orientation correction delta phi to achieve this. As before, the correction is split between the two bodies relative to their inverse inertias. Here you see the procedure to apply an angular correction delta phi. It is simpler than the linear version. In this case, we don't need the positions of the attachment points. Also, only the orientations q of the two bodies are modified. We can compute the torque acting on the constraint as lambda times n divided by delta t squared. We will now build our joint simulation on top of these two basic procedures. First we write a small set of procedures that serve as building blocks to simulate all joints that are used in the real world. The first procedure attaches two bodies at the attachment points P1 and P2. We can also provide a rest distance and a compliance. We first compute the current distance t between the attachment points. The vector n is the unit vector pointing from P1 to P2. The length of the correction vector is the difference between the current and the rest distance. The next procedure restricts the second attachment point P2 to be on an axis A through the first attachment point P1. We can also provide a lower and upper limit for the offset. Here we first compute the distance vector P from P1 to P2. 
applying this vector as a correction vector would attach P1 to P2. However, we want the bodies to be able to slide along the axis A. For this we compute the component of P along the axis A. Without limits we simply subtract this component from P. This step eliminates a correction along A. To respect limits we simply clamp the correction if limits are provided. The third procedure aligns two axes A1 and A2. The correction vector in this case is simply minus A1 cross A2. This is a fast approximation for small angles. The last building block is the procedure to limit the angle between two axes A1 and A2. The rotation axis is given by unit vector n. First we compute the current angle phi between the axis A1 and A2 with respect to the axis n. If the angle is within the bounds we don't have to do anything. Otherwise we clamp phi based on the limits. Next we compute A2 prime by rotating A1 by the angle phi. This is the direction A2 should have to form the desired angle. Now we apply an angular correction to rotate A2 into A2 prime. We are now ready to handle all joints with these four building blocks. For this we need attachment frames. An attachment frame is composed of a location P rest and a set of perpendicular axes A rest and B rest. We define these in the rest state of the bodies and store them with each body. Before solving a constraint, we transform these into world space using the current position x and the current rotation q of a body. The current attachment point is x plus the rest position p rest rotated by q. The current axes are the rest axes rotated by q. We are now ready to simulate individual joint types. The first is the hinge joint. We first force the two attachment points to be in the same location by calling the attach method with a rest length of zero and infinite stiffness. Then we align the rotation axis A1 and A2 of the bodies again with infinite stiffness. Finally we apply joint limits if requested. We can easily simulate a servo too. For this we perform the same operations as for the hinge joint. However, instead of having two angle limits we force the angle to be the desired angle phi servo. For a velocity motor, we use the limit angle procedure to force the angle to be phi motor. In addition, at every time step, we update this angle using the user specified angular velocity of the motor. To simulate a ball joint, we first align the attachment points as for the previous joints. To handle a swing limit, we limit the angle between the main axis A1 and A2 of the attachment frames. To handle a twist limit, we limit the angle between the secondary axis B1 and B2. As the rotation axis, we take the average of the two main axes A1 and A2. For a prismatic joint, instead of forcing the attachment positions to be at the same location, we restrict the attachment point of the second body to be on the main axis of the first body. Again, we consider limits. Then we align the main axis. Finally, we restrict the torsion around axis A1. Often for prismatic joints this torsion is forced to be zero. We can achieve this by setting the limits of phi and alpha to zero. A cylinder joint is a prismatic joint. However, for a cylinder joint we force the distance between the attachment points to a given value p target. We can achieve this by calling the restrict to axis procedure with a value p target. So far I have only talked about positions and orientations. To handle damping and application of forces and torques, we need to be able to correct linear and angular velocities as well. In this loop we apply corrections to the velocities after they are updated by XPBD. The procedure to add a linear velocity correction delta v looks very similar to the positional counterpart. We provide two points p1 and p2 and the velocity correction delta v. The method computes updates for the linear and angular velocities of the bodies. Here is the procedure to apply a correction to the angle velocities. As in the positional case we don't need the positions of the attachment points. We only need the correction vector delta omega. Also only the angle velocities are updated in this case. With these procedures we are now able to implement the last two missing features of joint simulation. Damping and the application of forces and torques. Here you see the method that applies linear damping along a direction n. This method is typically used to damp a prismatic joint. 
For a prismatic joint, N is the main axis A1. We also provide the attachment points and a scalar damping coefficient C linear. We first compute the difference of the velocities delta V at the attachment points P1 and P2. This is the relative velocity of the attachment point P2 with respect to the point P1. We then extract the component along the axis N. This is a scalar value. The part of delta V that is removed by damping is delta V times the damping coefficient C linear times the time step size delta T. The cool thing with XPBD is that we can make this step unconditionally stable by just clamping this value to not overshoot the value of 1. A value of 1 removes the relative velocity completely. This is very difficult to guarantee with global solvers. Angular damping is used to damp the rotation of hinge joints. Here n is the rotation axis of the hinge. We compute the relative angular velocity and extract the component along n. Then we subtract delta t times c angular. Again we make sure that we don't overshoot. Then we apply the corresponding angular velocity correction. We saw how to force the position of a cylinder to be at a certain offset. We can also control the cylinder by applying a force. The force is a scalar value and A is the main axis of the cylinder. According to Newton's second law, dividing the force by the time step size yields the necessary velocity correction. I showed you how to control a servo by specifying a target angle or a motor by specifying a velocity. Similarly, we can control these joints by applying a torque. Dividing the scalar torque by the time step size delta t yields the necessary angular correction. This concludes the tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it and I see you in the next one.